Did this episode play some Star Trek Enterprise music and mention Archer at least one time? Well, that makes this particular Trekkie really excited for this season. It is time yet again for another review of another Star Trek season premiere. I w would say this is special, but we're getting them all the time at this point, so it it's starting to lose its, like, specialness, but not that I'm complaining. I certainly love reviewing a new episode of Star Trek, because today we're reviewing Star Trek Discovery Season 4, Episode 1, Kobayashi Maru. And for those of you who are brand new to my channel, just so you know how we run things here, I'm going to give you my non-spoiler thoughts up front, and then after a little bit, I'll mention when we go into spoilers, there'll be a little bit of an ad break so you can get your pop popcorn, whatever you need, and then we're going to go full into spoilers and I'll break down the episode bit by bit. But with all that being said, let's get into the non-spoiler section because I'm really excited to talk about this episode because I really deeply enjoyed this season premiere. And jokes aside, it was not just because of Star Trek Enterprise references, though I was very pleased that there is a distinct moment there is a distinct moment in this episode where it's just like, hey, Star Trek Enterprise fans, we hear you, it's here for you. And I was so, so happy. I love that ugly duckling of the Star Trek franchise, even though I know, I know it's not the best, but heavens, if, if it's not one that I just enjoy despite all of its many clear flaws. But regardless of that reference, and we'll talk about that in the spoiler-filled section, but this episode has me excited not only for just the episode itself, but this entire season, because in many ways, this episode is laying the groundwork for a storyline and themes this season that I think I've always wanted Star Trek to tackle and do and feels very prescient in terms of where we are at in the world right now in terms of politics and just feelings of how can we come back from the darkness that we've been facing not just with COVID and the pandemic which last season seemed to be indirectly tackling even though that wasn't their intention but also just some of the political stuff that we've gone through both in the United States and around the world. Um, and I think that this season seems to be setting up those themes of healing, of how do we address some of the harm that we have caused, our certain political groups have caused, and how do we move forward from that? While also at the same time addressing certain themes, like as the title sort of alludes to with the Kobayashi Maru, some very Trekkian themes and actually addressing them and, and sort of challenging them in a strong way. Because this episode, without too many spoilers, really confronts that idea of the no-win scenario that the Kobayashi Maru has always been about in Star Trek, and that William Shatner, uh, William Shatner's Kirk confronted in Star Trek to the Wrath of Khan, and in other places as well. Um, and really going after this idea of, can we save everyone? Is it our ability to save everyone? Is this belief in the no-win scenario sometimes too much? Basically, is being a Kirk always a good thing? Uh, sort of idea. And I, I really think that this episode, both on the macro and micro scale through these characters, is, is doing that in such a great way. And as I mentioned before, I've always wanted Star Trek to really hone in on the politics of the Federation, of the world, of the Star Trek universe. And while Deep Space Nine did that before, so few other Star Trek shows have really addressed like the like inner machinations of politics. And this episode really seems to be setting up this idea of how do we rebuild the Federation? What does the Federation mean now after all of the stuff happening with the burn last season, as well as some of the implied harm that the Federation causing was causing even before the burn that we've seen in both the novels and some of the stuff that we saw uh, with stuff like Navarre and Vulcan and Romulan stuff last season as well. So how do we heal from that? And I think that this uh, episode is really confronting that. I'll talk about this more in spoilers, but I think it really matches with some of the politics that we're dealing with today in the United States and around the world. But as as much as I love themes and my Star Trek show aside, the other stuff of this episode is really great. While I do have some issues with still some of the like marvelization of Star Trek that we've seen throughout Discovery and, and still here in bits and pieces like overaction quippiness stuff going on, I think it's a little bit lessened especially after the opening segment and the rest of this episode just showed like characters being competent, characters being great Starfleet officers and like doing their job well and yes not perfectly in terms of like the issues and the, the dilemmas that they face but as officers competently doing their jobs I thought this episode just shined at that there's also a setup for a season-long storyline that we don't we get like little teases of towards the end of this and it definitely is sort of big like grand sweeping stakes that we've seen in all of Star Trek Discovery which I'm a little bit tired on on the sort of grand sweeping oh galaxies in danger stakes however I have I'll talk about this in the spoiler section I and we've seen it in trailers with like this idea of the anomaly I have hopes that if they take this well I think it could be 
actually one of the better season long story arcs that we've seen done but i think they needed to do it in a very specific way and they have not done that before so i'm hoping that this ends up not being a mystery box storyline and it doesn't seem to be leaning on that just yet but it has the potential to go that way so it's sort of a more of an open question mark after this premiere episode but i think they have the potential to do something good with it i'll save that for spoilers and the final thing too i think again visuals of this season of the, are extremely strong uh, as always with Star Discovery, but especially here, the music also was great. The opening sequence music was beautiful, but throughout this was wonderful as well. Also, the acting throughout this episode was absolutely fantastic. I want to distinctly call out Sneaker Martin Green, uh, Blue Del Barrio, and David Ajala, as well as the new Federation president that's introduced in this episode for, I think, really bringing it in the acting department this episode. I thought they all did fantastically. Everyone did fantastically, but those four particularly, I think, really shown throughout this episode. So with all that said, that is my spoiler-free thoughts, and that means we're going to go into spoiler-free discussion in just a second right after this ad. I want to thank Atlas VPN for sponsoring this video. Atlas VPN is a tool that encrypts your data and hides your virtual location. When you use it, your traffic is encrypted and routed towards the VPN server. Basically putting it into simple terms, Atlas VPN allows you to use the internet with privacy because you know, you know me, Jesse likes your private internet time. Very much so. Very much so. But seriously, Atlas VPN is offering a big discount on a three-year subscription. So if you use the link in the description below, which also helps me, by the way, you can get yourself a really awesome deal. But by the way, another cool feature of VPNs is that you can use it to connect your computer to other countries' internets. I mean, considering what I'm reviewing right now, Star Trek Discovery was recently announced that it was leaving Netflix in the United Kingdom and other international markets, which sucks, by the way. But if you use Atlas VPN, you can make your internet appear that it's in the United States and get into Paramount Plus and watch Star Trek Discovery easy peasy no matter where you are. Don't tell Paramount, though. Atlas VPN also has a data breach monitor feature where if you insert your email address, it will scan the internet to see if your email has been associated with any data breaches or things like that with like your sensitive passwords, your name, any of your private data, and will send you notifications of that or if it happens in the future, which is a really cool feature. So Atlas VPN is very, very cool. And as I said before, Atlas VPN is offering a really big discount on a three year subscription for just, I believe it's $139 a month, according to my notes here, which is actually pretty cheap for uh, one month, but it is a limited time offer. So if you use the link in the description below, you can get that deal right now. Um, and again, it does help me out if you use it. So with all that said, thank you so much Atlas VPN for sponsoring this video and let's get back to the review. All right, everybody, we are in spoiler filled discussion time. I don't know why this is the theme for that, but there you go, that's what I'm doing. But as per usual, I'm gonna break this down scene by scene or storyline by storyline as it goes through and discuss every little aspect of this episode that I deeply, deeply enjoyed. So for our opening, we have Book and Burnham going down to a butterfly planet, I guess, to try to negotiate with these people to say, hey, the Federation's back, we would love to have you join us, uh, but we're just going to give you some dilithium in order to, you know, just show our goodwill. I had things with this opening sequence that I really loved and really hated. Let me start with the things that I disliked. It did remind me a lot of Star Trek Beyond's opening, um, where you have, like, Kirk kind of fumbling the negotiating and it kind of falling apart in a very comedic way, which works kind of for Beyond in just sort of a big budget blockbuster film. But in a TV show, this opening, I know the show wants to have its, like, big funny, like, action-packed opening to start off a season with, but it was sort of like, really, they're, they're, like, they're going to bungle this negotiation so hard when it feels like it's so important to, like, negotiate with these people, and they're not gonna, like, know basic negotiating tactics, and they should have had an ambassador there at some point to help them, rather than it just being Book and Burnham kind of going to talk to them. It felt a little bit forced in order to have this, like, comedic over-the-top bit at the beginning, and it was very marvelized with some of the quips and jokes, which I did find funny. They were very funny, like, oh, you have a queen uh captive when they're talking about grudge because she is a queen as we all know so i did find it funny but it was also a little bit like oh this is kind of like doing that marvelization like quippy bit that i'm a little bit uh I, I, I'm not against overall but i don't love as much in a show like star discovery i don't hate it but i'm not like over enthused with it here that being said the other aspects of this opening were fantastic again we start to see the crew being really competent over on discovery we also have bryce taking the command seat which is awesome to see though i was a little bit confused why tilly wasn't in that seat given that she was kind of placed as like the first officer last season but we'll get to that probably in future episodes but i also really liked that their whole point with being here was we just want to show good faith we want to bring you the dilithium and them the butterfly people being a little bit reticent on that like you were the federation did wrong by us before why should we trust you now and i really love that idea of we've been harmed before so why do, can do you think that you deserve our trust and i think that that is a really salient idea of like how do we come back 
from being involved in a government that's done a lot of harm. I mean, the Federation has always been like an idealized America in a lot of senses. And obviously, the there's different discussion to talk about the bad things that America has done, especially in recent years, but throughout its history. So there's a different equivalence here. But I do think there is this idea of like, how do we recover from having been so horrible in our very recent past and our, you know, long standing history past when we've really failed these people. And I think that that theme, I hope, will come out throughout the rest of the season. I really like seeing a little like instigator of it here. And again, I am someone who has always wanted more politics in Star Trek. And so to see like the seedings of like political negotiations as we see even more throughout the episode I am very excited for all of that I also loved that the way they solve this problem is not by like blowing stuff up or the action but that they actually help these people by reestablishing their arrays and fixing their arrays and actually like showing like we were here in good faith we're not here to fight you we're here to help you and I liked that was like a beginning of showing like we need to earn your trust and I, I just enjoy that moment I like that the butterfly people didn't outright say like hey we're on your side now but they were just like hmm maybe maybe they are coming here in good faith so all of that was great uh, as an opening beat, and I thought that was a strong thematic beat and strong um, action beat to open the season on. Next, I'll quick jump over the Saru Kaminar scenes here because those are really quick to deal with and kind of isolated on their own. First off, I should say you can clearly see the digital sets being used here in Kaminar. Their uh, Discovery is using that same sort of uh, sets that the Mandalorian used, where it's just sort of like the, the LED walls that um, place everyone in an environment, and you can make you can definitely see that with uh, Kaminar as well as like the Starfleet Academy bits later on in the episode. I thought it looked simply gorgeous. But beyond that, I liked seeing that um, Saru sort of stepping forward as an ambassador, sort of an honored elder here. And we've seen that the Cam uh, Kaminoans? Kaminars? Cam 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 Kaminar people. The Kelpian people. Why am I not remembering the name of the speech of the Kelpians um, are now working with the Ba'ul uh, and they've like really joined in and focused, like made kind of a mini federation on their home planet after so much strife that we saw way back in Star Trek Discovery season two. So that was really awesome to, to see here and really like a mini version of the federation. I like Saru calling that even further saying like, well, we home doesn't have to be just defined as our planet now. We can define it as the entire galaxy, the community that we're entering into as evoked by the Ba'ul and um, the Kem Kaminoans, the Kelpians. Oh, dear gosh. My brain is just not, like, connecting those words for some reason today. Also, they remind me of the Gungans, like this underwater temple thing from Star Wars. So my brain's just hitting a lot of different crosswires at the moment, which is probably why I'm confused. But I particularly love Saru's line, do we honor our interconnectedness or do we curl inwards? I thought that was a beautiful, very Star Trekian line. Um, and then the next scene that we get a little bit further on in the episode, we have Sakal and Saru kind of connecting again with Sakal saying like people sometimes haven't forgiven me for what happened with the burn after last season but I've now made more friends I've met more people and again that kind of evoking this idea of interconnectedness and people recovering from trauma and finding healing from trauma and forgiving people for trauma whether it was incidental or intentional um, incidental in Sakal's case so I, I love the macro theming and the micro theming really mirroring each other here and Sakal saying go out back to Starfleet and, and serve them because that's what you're good at um, and I like seeing that sort of like him pushing his friend to do more and the sweet moment where he said you are like a father to me I wish we gotten to see that I'm sure it'll be developing like novels and expanded universe stuff uh, but it was a very sweet moment here next up we have Burnham and Book talking about the opening of a new Starfleet Academy which I really enjoyed seeing that whole sequence also there's a Tribble walking in the hall are Tribbles now part of the Federation are they intelligent now there's many questions that I have about the Tribble but regardless again I really love Sonequa Martin Green's and David Ajala's chemistry they just bounce off of each other so well I, I you really feel that they are a couple like they they just have so much romantic and like just regular chemistry together it just is wonderful to see but then we get Burnham's speech which I thought was really wonderful to the Starfleet crew you can also see because there's so few Starfleet cadets and they're kind of spaced out you can definitely tell that this was filmed during the pandemic they didn't have a lot of extras to bring on here so some elements of the pandemic seeping into some of the visuals of the series and but I guess it kind of fits with like maybe Starfleet doesn't have a ton of recruits yet so uh, I, you can definitely see some of the production issues uh, coming through here but that's not their fault but then we meet the new Federation president, Laura Rylick, I believe is her name, who is part Bajoran, part Cardassian, part human. Again, evoking that idea of interconnectedness just in who she is. And I love her makeup as well. But I also, again, like that we're finally acknowledging that the Federation and Starfleet are separate entities. We tend to conflate the two a lot of the time in Star Trek. And I like the idea, like, again, civilian government, military slash scientific exploration, 
I like that separation, the acknowledgement of that separation, and also her acknowledging that Starfleet is getting back to being a scientific exploration-based unit rather than just a military one that came out after the burn. So that was cool as well to see, and I love Stemets having a moment where he just, like, smiles uh, at that bit. Also, question here, I mean, they didn't have much interaction this episode, but no Stemets burn tension from last season? I hope that that gets paid off a little bit because it was uh, such a big deal at the end of last season, and I hope there's some reticence there, but we'll see if that continues, but there was no real opportunity for it to show up in this episode. But then we get a moment that I've already alluded to and absolutely loved was there's a new Starfleet uh, shipyard and it's Archer's shipyard and they play the Archer's theme in the background the sort of end credits music from Star Trek Enterprise during that bit and I was like I was sitting here and I was like oh god they're speaking to me they made this for me I'm just going to assume I know the Star Trek Discovery writers probably don't even know who I am but I'm going to assume they made that scene for me because it felt like it was made specifically for me so I'm going to take it I'm going to take it also during the scene we meet a new bridge crew member I didn't catch his name but he looks cool and I'm glad to see in there so we'll probably learn a little bit more about them but I hope we get a little bit more development of the other bridge crew members this season like Oo Detmer Bryce um all the rest of them uh so it's cool to see a new one but I hope we get some development of this person as well. But then Admiral Vance gets a distress call from Deep Repair Station, Deep Space Repair, Deep Space Repair Beta 6. I wrote it down. I'm cheating a little bit here. But uh, they get us a distress call that sends Discovery off on uh, to go do that. And the Federation president wants to tag along. And I like the sequence and the dynamics in this scene because Burnham is very much like, I don't feel comfortable with you coming. And then she's very clearly, as she tells Vance later on, it's like she's just a politician trying to tick a box to be in action to like appear good. And I like that Admiral Vance kind of sits the conversation out and just sort of lets Burnham handle it and sees how she's handling it. I thought that was a uh, cool leadership on his part. Admiral Vance has always been like, I think he's been wonderfully written. I like just him sort of being like, let's see how she handles this one. See if she she can she, she can take it. And I, and I like to think that even though Vance disagreed with Burnham, he was number one seeing how she was going to handle it as well as not wanting to show like inter-conflict between Starfleet members in front of the president. So I thought that was well played in his silence, the very tactical silence. And I loved afterwards that him saying like look maybe a politician can be a good thing in these uncertain times um and maybe just give her a chance and i also like burnham pointing out that like he got to have bring his family home after we got a little reference of them last season that was very sweet i will say i live for admiral vance's smiles because that's so so adorable he has such a cute little smile i say of the military admiral commander but still he's so cute but then we get the sequence where i'm just going to call it starfleet being competent sequence where discovery jumps to the deep space station and Really, everything that just handles here is like Burnham's like on it. The crew's on it. They are just getting things done. They are like, we're going to come help you. Who do I need to assign? What do I do? It was just like very cool to see like everyone just on their game, just getting things done and Burnham being a really competent commander. Also, I meant to mention this earlier during the opening sequence, but I I'm still not entirely sold on Burnham saying let's fly as her like go to warp thing. But Sneaker Martin Green pretty much sells it like anyone else i mean i couldn't say let's fly i couldn't sell it, but sneaker martin green almost makes it work still not in love with it but she she gets she gets dang close now i'm not gonna go through beat through beat through this entire action sequence but i'll call out some specific stuff that i noticed there's definitely again clearly some flirting between oo and detmer going on here uh i love that stuff uh, leave me i am such an oo detmer shipper i am here for it i hope that they make it a little bit more explicit this season because up until now it's been very clear that they are leaning into that with all the sideline looks and like jokes between the two of them and it does feel a little bit like queer baiting, and I'm giving the writers the benefit of the doubt here. So I'm f here for it. I'm excited about it. Please make it explicit at some point in the near future, because otherwise it's getting frustrating if it's queer baiting. That being said, I'm enjoying it. So giving you the benefit of the doubt on that front, I liked it here. Then we have Adira and Tilly going over to the ship. We also get a little scene between Adira and Gray, getting a little reminder that Gray's there. I also love the like little banter where Gray's just like, I, when I corporealize, like, when you get a body. And I like that reminder that we're still looking for a body for uh, for Gray and bringing him back, which will be nice to see at some point, hopefully in the near future as well. Because it's not Star Discovery if they're not reversing their barrier gaze, apparently. <laughs> Uh, sad but true, sad but true. I also loved the gravity nightmare that they said uh, when they went over to the Deep Space Station. Everything's upside down. It was a very cool set to see. Again, probably another digital set, but I loved it. It was it was gorgeous. And I like this Nihilus guy kind of being frustrated, and you see him kind of being a little bit over his head, but trying to, like, I understand and say, hey, let me do this. I got this. And I like Adira and Tilly kind of being negotiating with him. I also like that Adira's kind of taking on the Tilly mantle where, like, Adira, where they constantly are, like, oh, a little bit flustered and everything 
everything like that. And I like seeing that Tilly is very much kind of taken much more of the commander role and evolved a little bit. So I, I just, I, I like seeing that a little bit of a flip of dynamics between Tilly and now Adira. Also, it should be noted that there seemed like a moment on the bridge earlier when they called Adira up to the bridge where they like emphasize the word they for Adira, like their pronouns, like bring them up to the bridge. Uh, I appreciate it. I get it. There tends to be sometimes with like writers writing non-binary characters, especially if they're not non-binary themselves, to like overuse the pronouns they to be like, hey, they need to come up to the bridge. We need to talk to them. Like it's just overemphasizing the they them pronouns. I get it. I get it. It is it is a nice thing to acknowledge that non-binary people use different pronouns, but I think it's just a little bit, do it a little bit more naturally, but maybe, maybe I'm just noticing it because it, it's calling out to me. I appreciate it. I'm not hating on it. It's just one of those things that I'm a little bit like aware of like, oh, you I see what you're doing. You're trying to be like, hey, look, we're getting it right. And like, yes, yes, you are. Yes, you are. You are getting it right. And I appreciate it. I see you. You don't need to overemphasize it, my friends. <laughs> Then we get Burnham going off into space to try and rescue everybody. And the, this really interesting moment where the president basically calls Burnham out and says, don't be a Kirk. It's like, should you leave the bridge? I don't think it's a really good idea. And I like that this works on multiple levels, as we'll talk a little bit more in just a second. But it also kind of fits Burnham, not only as character, but just the era she came from. Like, she's from the 23rd century where Captain's like, yeah, we'll go off down the bridge. Captain Pike and Captain Kirk, they jump down on the planets all the dang time. Um, and so the more evolved attitude of the 31st century, I'm just betting the president's like, old, old 23rd century people. <laughs> <laughs> also, the action sequence here was very, very cool. I know some problems people will probably have problems with it, but I like the sort of like Burnham getting hit and then like having the suit come on her and jumping off into space and like fixing stuff. I thought that was pretty badass and very Star Trek y, like cool action sci fi stuff that didn't like over the top, like like being like, oh, magic y YNC science, but like felt like this was a bit over the top, very action y, very modern Star Trek, but I still think like not like as crazy over the top as we've seen some modern Star Trek be, and I thought it was a lot of fun. But then I love that Burnham eventually gets everyone back, but obviously Nihilus and three or two other people die but she saves nine other people and i also love the tension between her and the president where the president basically says hey uh you can't save everybody and i also like burnham saying like did you just lie to him did you just lie to nihilus when she sort of calmed nihilus down by evoking his planet um and she like maybe she lied about whether she saw him or not and uh, kind of like that politician's role in all this to inspire and to calm and maybe she's been there maybe she's not but a good politician knows how to you know inspire people and manipulate people in a good way and uh, manipulating is not necessarily here bad or good inherently um obviously there's obviously a very negative connotation to it but she was able to calm him down in that moment maybe lying to do so but you know it was the right thing that needed to happen in that moment and so i'm really liking this president quite a bit like clearly she's antagonistic towards burnham um and maybe an antagonistic type character throughout the season but i think she brings up some really good points and i think will be interesting to see how her character develops over the course of the season whether she'll be more of a villain or just an antagonist uh going forward because i could see either and i'm actually really here if she's just an antagonist but not overtly villainous because i actually found myself kind of agreeing with her throughout this episode if not always agreeing with how she uh called out things on the bridge but then again Burnham did it to her as well so tit for tat I guess but then we get our final conversation between Burnham and the president that I absolutely adored with the president saying like hey uh I have a new type of technology that we're going like a new spore drive that we're going to make and put on the Voyager J I guess I love the reference and call out to the Voyager there but I don't think you're ready as captain after what I've seen here and I came along to evaluate you and I think that you uh don't understand the lesson of the Kobayashi Maru uh this whole idea of no win scenario and this is something that not only fits the time period as I referenced earlier for Burnham but who Burnham is as a character as we've learned throughout this entire season she is the woman who carries the weight of the world on her shoulders and she can't let there be a no win scenario for her just like Kirk before her and or after her I guess technically and and I think that that's such a great like theme to dig into because it works very well for Burnham and I think it's a well thing, good thing to call her out for because the president has a good point. You cannot save everyone all of the time and sometimes choices have to be made and you have to understand that. And I think that that is an apt thing for Burnham to be called out on. And yet I also understand her point that's like, I can't mitigate choosing between life and death for people. I have to try to save everyone as best I can. And I really think that given where some of the bigger stuff of the season is going to go, this might be a really great theme for this show to delve into and the balance between these two things. Because I think there's, you know, we have this question of the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. It's a very Star Trekian ethos, right from Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. But the question is like, what does that mean? 
I think there's so many things like, who do we save? Who do we like save over the expense of other people? Is it sometimes minorities? Do we put the, like, do we ignore minorities for other people and say the needs of the many or weigh the needs of the few when we could be taking care of minorities? I think that this question has a lot more nuance than Star Trek has always given it credence for. And I think that if this is a, the show's sort of statement of the theme of this season to calling out Burnham on this and the back and forth between the president's point of view and Burnham's point of view and that there is a middle ground there, I think that there is a lot of shades of gray, uh, not to reference a terrible episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, but there are a lot of shades of gray in this idea that I think that they can really hone in on and I think make a really great season about because I think it is pertinent to ask. Like, yeah, it might be easy to say, oh, we saved more people over less people, but is it sometimes saying like, oh, we're going to save these people because it's easier for us and we could save everybody, but it's just easier to save these people at the expense of like this minority group or something like that. Like there's so many different questions within that that I think um, this season has the possibility to raise. Now, it might not, but I think it, it quite could. But this brings us to the end of the episode where we also had Book's storyline going on through this episode where he was going back to see his family. I uh, had this wonderful little ceremony. I thought it was a very adorable ceremony where he like gives like blood of himself and you know the sap of the tree. I thought it was a really great ceremony. I, I liked that idea of quite a bit. But then uh, he goes on to space after some weird stuff happens. Some birds falling out of the sky. Very Alfred Hitchcock. Very scary. Uh, but then he gets shoved off into space and ends up back on the Discovery because he was nearby conveniently because plot. But I, I, it's, it's not that big a deal for me because it's sort of like Eh, whatever, they were close by. They weren't that interconnected to be that, like, upset about the convenience of him showing up in the Discovery. But regardless, they look and find that his planet has been destroyed by some sort of gravitational anomaly, which I'm sure is going to be the big running theme for this season. So, looking at that, I think that that is very, very cool. Now, this is going to enter a little bit into speculation. I'll try and keep it quick because this is just my thoughts on this. It might be different going into future episodes. But... As I've mentioned before in different other reviews and streams and things like that, I have not been a fan of the mystery box storytelling of Star Trek Discovery. I think that it ultimately, when they do a mystery box on Discovery, it leads to it being feeling a little bit nebulous throughout most of the season because they don't have an answer. And then when they do get to the answer, it ends up feeling disappointing because they weren't able to properly pay off earlier stuff that they had set up because they were just like, I oh, will throw a few things out in the wind and we'll try and make it all fit in the end. Um, and it gets a little bit frustrating for me. What I'm hoping this season does is that the the anomaly, which I'm sure we'll learn more about next episode, is not caused by like a person, there's some like evil nefarious thing going on here, but maybe it's just an anomaly caused by, maybe it's going back to Star Trek The Next Race in Season 7, that episode where we learned that the, the terrible episode, but that warp bubbles, that dilithium actually is hurting subspace. And so the fact that we're using dilithium all over and again, and it's starting to come back, is causing these, these anomalies to occur. And this could be a great discussion for climate change on the show, that like the overuse of dilithium is hurting the universe and we can't keep using the lithium so maybe we'll have to shift to cleaner energy which gets referenced throughout this episode by the way with the president referencing that they have other types of technology like new spore drives or this like proto star drive i think or something like that that they mentioned earlier that they're working on which maybe uh, maybe i'm just thinking of prodigy i don't maybe she didn't use the other words but maybe it's a reference to what's going on in prodigy star trek prodigy over there but regardless i think there's clearly groundwork there for like maybe this isn't like evil plot but just a climate change disaster and i think will fit not only the themes of uh climate change that this could go into but also themes of how do we save people who do we save at different points um as well as this idea of like coming together or do we shrivel apart do we get interconnected do we rebuild the federation or like the during the burn before do we all separate off do we isolate ourselves do we pull back from getting together and i think that those themes i think this if this anomaly is a naturally occurring phenomenon not a dastardly twirling villain sort of thing that we've seen in previous seasons or like caused by a person i think that this could be a really great way to really delve into these themes However, I can't say it's good or bad just yet. I know the tendency of Discovery writers before have been to do the mystery box storytelling, and if they go that route, I will be frustrated. But if they don't go that route, I think this has potential for some really, really good ideas and themes to be developed throughout the season. Um, and as this episode has made clear, this statement of fact of this first episode with the, all these themes sort of being instigated and set up to be explored in future episodes has me very excited for this season because it seems like they're addressing politics. They're addressing questions of like really just honing in on like questions of so that Star Trek is always asked and like evolving those ideas ideas and themes in really cool ways so this episode for me gets an, an a not an a plus because there's still a few things here and there like the marvelized stuff and the over action sequences here and there that i didn't particularly enjoy but overall i think this is a brilliant episode a brilliant premiere and has me very excited for the season even if i'm a little bit cautious based on prior history but if they can pay this off i think that they have a probably one of my favorite seasons of star trek i've ever had um because this is this type of story is the type of story I've always wanted Star Trek to address and always wanted Star Trek to do. And uh, I think that they're doing it and it has me very, very pumped to be 
quite frank with you. But with all that said, that is my review for Star Trek Discovery Season 4, Episode 1, Kobayashi Maru. I'd love to hear what all of you thought about the episode, so let me know down in the down below if you liked this episode, if you hated this episode. Um, I'd love to hear all of it, but regardless, don't forget to subscribe to this channel. I have a Patreon page that you can get, like, bonus perks and things like that. I also have other video essays and things on this channel. I have a video on Star Trek and the history of Star Trek that I'm very, very pumped about coming out in just a few weeks. Um, and if you want to support that, Patreon does help me pay the pills. It does help uh, me get to be able to do the bigger pieces that I do on this channel. But regardless, thank you so much for watching. I hope that you, as always, live long and stay sexy.